I want to call your attention to a passage of scripture that both speaks and frightens as we have some locker room conversation about preaching God's word. In the seventh book of the Old Testament, the book of Judges, in the 16th chapter, we are introduced to a brother that we all know very well. His name is Samson. And in the 20th verse of the 16th chapter of the book of Judges, there is a word from the Lord that frightens me. And I pray by the time I'm done, it will frighten you. Judges chapter 16, verse number 20, reads variously as follows. And she, meaning Delilah, said to Samson, the Philistines are on you. So he awoke out of his sleep and he said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. You may be seated. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. About a year ago, I was given the favor and the grace, the invitation to come and stand before you. I was not able to come, as some of you all know. Prior to coming, I was out playing basketball with my son and was quickly reminded that 50 is on the way. While in the midst of playing with him, I tore my patellar tendon, required surgery and nine months of rehabilitation before I could walk right again. Any of you that have ever had a muscular injury like that know that at some point along the rehabilitation journey, physical therapy is necessary. When I went to see the physical therapist, I thought Dr. Mapson that I was there to regain the flexibility in my knee only for my therapist to tell me that our primary work here is not to get the flexibility of the knee, the primary responsibility is to strengthen your quadricep. She said, having been off of your leg for eight weeks and not walking, your left quadricep has atrophied, which means that it is smaller and weaker than your right leg. She said, you are out of balance because you've got strength in one leg that will always be hindered by the weakness in the other. And in order for us to get you right, we've got to get you strong on both sides. Because it is not your strength that will determine the quality of your walk, but it is your weakness. Now, you haven't said a man because you think I'm speaking about biology, but I'm now talking about life. I'm now talking about the calling to preach God's word that it is not our strength that determines our walk with God, but rather our capacity to deal with our weaknesses. If I've come by to tell you that God can grant you great strength, God can grant you favor, God can open up doors of opportunity, God can place you on platforms high and lift it up. But if you will not deal with the weaknesses that we hide, you will join the list that is littered in life from both pulpit and pew of those who had great strength in one area but never became all they could because of a weakness they would not deal with. If you don't know anyone who is a portrait of strength limited by weakness, then you need to hang out in Judges just a little bit. For there is no greater image or portrait of a man who was strong but yet limited by his weakness other than Samson. You are preachers in this place. I need not remind you of Sunday School 101, Samson. Is the, bro is the son of a brother named Manoah from the tribe of Dan. And you will recall that Manoah's wife is barren up until the time an angel comes to tell her she's going to have a child. 
And with the prophecy of a child that is forthcoming, the angel also gives her some restrictions on behavior during her pregnancy because her child will be a Nazarite. Nazarite simply means that this child will have a consecrated assignment from the Lord. And if you go back to Numbers chapter 6, you will recall that there are three restrictions on a Nazarite's life. Don't forget these, there'll be a pop quiz later in the sermon. The three restrictions of a Nazarite are that they can touch no dead body, they can drink no alcoholic substance, and they can never have their hair cut. Three restrictions of a Nazarite. No touching dead bodies. No Hennessy, no Crown Royal, no Jim Beam, no Ciroc. And the hair can never be cut. This Samson is a Nazarite who has an assignment from God to lead Israel in battle against its dreaded enemies of the Philistines. Samson is to be a military leader. Samson is to bring victory for Israel. Samson is to stand on the battlefield and get done what no man has ever gotten done. And to equip Samson, God has granted him unprecedented strength. Samson, as you know from Sunday school, is the strongest man in the Bible. Samson is so strong, he kills lions with his bare hand. Samson's so strong, he takes a jawbone of a donkey and kills a thousand Philistines equipped only with a jawbone. No man has ever been as strong as Samson. But for all of his strength, his weakness is exposed by a bad mamma jamma. A sister by the name of Delilah. Delilah is such a bad sister that no good Bible reading mother or father names their daughter Delilah. For the name Delilah is synonymous with exposing the weakness that will bring a man down. You know the story. The Philistines are tired of Samson, but they cannot figure out what makes him weak. And so they offer Delilah 1,100 pieces of silver if she will simply find out what the source of his strength is. Repeatedly she asks him, and repeatedly he lies. This is a dysfunctional relationship. She says, Sam, what's the source of your strength? He says, if you tie me with seven bow strings, I'll lose my strength. He wakes up in the morning. He's tied with seven bow strings. The Philistines come. He jumps up, frees himself, and defeats them. She comes back the next night. Sam, what's the source of your strength? He says, if you tie me with some wet new rope, then I'll lose my strength. He wakes up in the morning, bound with wet new rope, frees himself, defeats the Philistines. She comes back again. Sam, what's the source of your strength? If you braid my hair. He wakes up in the morning, his hair is braided. He frees himself, defeats the Philistines, and then she says to him, you don't love me. Because if you loved me, you wouldn't lie to me. Finally, Samson says to her, the source of my strength is my hair. If you cut my hair, I'll be like any other man. He lays down. She has a brother come in, cut his hair off. She hollers to him, the Philistines are on you. He jumps up and says, I'll go fight them as I always have. But the dilemma this time is that he does not know that the Lord has departed. He thinks he's strong only to stand up and not know that God ain't with him. But, but beloved, it, it's a tragedy for the Lord not to be with you. 
but it's doubly damnable for you not to know it. What a damnable thing to stand thinking you're prepared and not know God ain't with you. What a shame to think that you are homiletically and exegetically correct only to know that God ain't with you. What a shame it is to work with your musician to know what key you're going to close in and not know that God ain't with you. What a shame to stand before thousands of folk and declare what you believe, the word of God, only to find out that God is not with you. And that one verse frightens me because, beloved, it raises the possibility and the potential that we can stand thinking we're strong and not know that God isn't with us. How could he not know that the Lord wasn't with him? What makes a strong man like that weak? Beloved, that's a good question. It's one that ought to haunt us as those who take seriously our assignment to stand before the people of God in the strength of God that there's a possibility God may not be with us if we fall victim to some of the same things that took Samson down. Might we wrestle a little bit? What makes Samson weak? Might I suggest to you that one of the things that weakens this strong man is that he cites a strange source of his strength. But beloved, what I'm about to say, we can only do it in the safe space because it is, it's going to contradict what your second grade Sunday school teacher taught you. Delilah asked Samson on the fourth occasion, what is the source of your strength? Samson says, my hair. Now, now we tie that in to the three Nazarite commandments, no drink, no dead body, and no haircut. And we naturally assume that since one of the Nazarite commandments is no haircut, that the violation of the haircut is what causes the loss of strength. The problem with that is that if you rewind to chapter 14 and read through chapter 15, you will find that Samson has violated all commandments before he got his hair cut. He kills a lion and goes back and eats out of the lion, which means he touches the dead carcass of a lion, which is the violation of Nazarite commandment. But even when he touches the dead body, he doesn't lose his strength. He then goes to a wedding down in Philistine territory, which is laced with wine, as we know is the culture, and what is subtly implied in scripture is that Samson has been drinking wine many days and many nights. A violation of Nazarite commandment. But yet he doesn't lose his strength. And since he touches a dead thing and is still strong, drinks wine and is still strong, we naturally conclude by the process of elimination that the strength must lie in the hair. So that when the hair is cut, the strength has to go. The problem with that is that no matter what your Sunday school teacher taught you, there's nowhere in scripture where God says your strength is in your hair. That word doesn't come from the angel. It's nowhere in scripture. We have made that up by process of elimination. But if you look at Samson, now let's get deep. When you look at Samson, every time he manifested great physical strength, watch what happens. When he goes to kill a lion with his bare hand, before he exhibits strength, 
the verse before the killing of the lion says, and the spirit of the Lord fell mightily on him. When he exhibits physical strength, killing the men of Ashkelon right before he kills them, the verse before it says, the spirit of the Lord fell mightily on him. When it takes a jawbone of a donkey before he kills a thousand men, the verse right before it says, and the spirit of the Lord fell mightily on him. Might I argue with you today that the source of Samson's strength was never his hair. The source of his strength was that he had a God who when he needed him most knew how to be certain that his spirit descended on his servant to give him the strength he needed to fight the battle he had to fight. That his true strength was the spirit of the Lord. Now, 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 I know it's happening. Brother Jones, somebody's asking this question. Someone's saying, well, Reverend, if that's the case, if that's the case, why is it that when his hair is cut, he loses his strength? If, if you're arguing that the source of the strength was never the hair, then why does he lose his strength when his hair is cut? Could it be that Samson loses strength when his hair is cut because that's where he thought his strength came from. And since that's what he believed in his mind that was a source of his strength, when it's cut, he loses his strength. And here's the problem. When he thinks the source of his strength is his hair, he identifies his strength in a place she can cut. Sister preacher, brother pastor, the question I have for you is, what do you think is the source of your strength? What do you think equips you to stand and proclaim the word of God? How do you think God has enabled you to do what God has called you to do? Is, is, it, is it the seminary degree on the wall? Is it the accolade of the crowd? Is it the amen from Sister Johnson on the left-hand side every Sunday morning? What is the source of your strength? In case you got too much Samson in you, allow me to tell you that the source of our preaching power has never been our homiletical, exegetical, hermeneutical insight. It has never been our systematic theology. Whether you are Bartian or Tidlickian, that is not the source of our strength. The source of our strength is that we serve a God who when we stand and open up the pages of his holy word allows his spirit to descend upon us. And, and if you identify your source as anything other than the Spirit of God, you put it in a place that can get cut. If you find strength in the amen over there, the amen won't come every now and then. If you find strength in the numbers you look at when you stand, there's going to be a new church around the corner that opens up and preaches a good old fluffy gospel and the numbers won't be there. If you find strength in your physical ability, Arthur will come and get you and you'll find out you can't preach with the physical strength you used to have. So what is the source of your strength? Can you imagine how Samson's life would have played out if the conversation went like this? Delilah says, Sammy, what is the source of your strength? And imagine Samson's response if he had said, the Lord is the source of my strength. Oh, and guess what, Delilah, there's nothing you can do about the Lord being the source of my strength. I wish I had a Bible reader here for I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate and cut me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. 
that if we would stand in power, you got to know the source of your strength. Can, can I give you another one? I'm Baptist. I got three and I'll be out of your way. That, that he's weakened because he cites a strange source for his strength. But let me give you the second one that I think weakens Samson is that he is seduced into self-sufficiency by his success. Um, Samson is a Nazarite. Wrestle with me for a minute, which means he's had no haircut. And Brother Bland, by this stage, we believe that Samson is at least 22 years old. 22 years and never had a haircut. Now I'm not gonna have you touch your neighbor, but would somebody say that's a lot of hair? I, I get tired of touching my neighbor. I, <laughs> 22 years of no haircut. That's a lot of hair. Matter of fact, he's got so much hair that the Bible says it's braided by Delilah into seven locks that go all the way down his back. That's a lot of hair. So he tells her it's his hair. He lays down in her lap. She hires another man to come in the bedroom while he sleep on her lap and not cut his hair, shave it. No, the, the, these aren't clippers. This is a straight edge and some Barbasol. He has 22 years of hair shaved off by another man. How does he not wake up with a man shaving his head? Come on, this locker room talk, we safe? What has she put on him? Can I pull over? I'm going to keep the car running, but let me just give you this for free. Um, you, you really have to be careful of where you lay your head. Because hear me, it's not the pulpit you stand on, it's the pillow you sleep on that determines your real strength. And in some places, you lay down at night will leave you weak in the morning. That's for free, that's for free, that's for free. So he has 22 years of hair shaved off. When he wakes up in the morning, there is no way he doesn't know he's bald headed. 22 years of hair is gone. That's a lot of hair gone. There's no way Samson doesn't know he's lost his hair. Now wrestle with me. If he thinks his hair is his strength and he wakes up and he knows his hair is gone, why does he go fight? If you thought that was your strength, and now it's all gone. Why would you get up to go fight against the Philistines? Because what he says is, I'm gonna get up and do what I've always done. That, that I fought them before. And since I've done it before, I just believe that I can do it again. And he believes that he's got the same strength, even without his hair, that he can always do what he's always done. As a matter of fact, he gets up to go fight and he doesn't even invoke the power of God. There's no prayer before the battle. 
Can I ask you a question? What are you so good at? You don't even pray over no more. What are you so proficient at that you don't invoke God's help in it anymore? What do you do so well that prayer doesn't even need to be part of the recipe of how you get it done because you believe that you've done it so well, so often, so long, and so good that now God has just gifted you to do it all by yourself. Listen to what he says. I'll shake myself free. Yeah. Beloved, I came by to tell you on a Tuesday afternoon, you can't do nothing by yourself. You can't wake up by yourself. You can't understand God's word by yourself. You can't preach by yourself. You can't be affected by yourself. That you do nothing without the power of God in your life. And here is the problem of Samson that seduces so many of us that success will set you up for satanic seduction that you believe you can just do what you've always done and what Samson doesn't understand is that when you are working with and for God success is not a formula it is a gift of grace it is not because your introduction had a smooth transition to your three buttrick movements of your sermon that then closed with the Henry Mitchell celebration of the, of the Frank Thomas assurance of grace. That is not where the power of the sermon lies. You cannot fabricate success in the kingdom. You cannot manipulate success in the kingdom. You cannot earn success in the kingdom. You cannot merit success in the kingdom. You cannot climb your way up God's holy ladder. That whatever you get, it is by the grace of God. And the problem with Samson is that every victory he had by grace he took credit for himself and never gave God glory. And I came by to remind you that whatever you receive by grace ought to mandate a glory given unto God. Because when you recognize it was not by your hand and not by your mind and not by your strength and not by your training and not by your schooling and not by your reputation, but it was by the grace of God. And when you know it is a gift of grace, you ought to return glory to God for what God has done that grace demands glory brother preacher sister preacher there ought be no one in your church that out shouts you because if anybody in the sanctuary knows how gracious God has been if anybody in the sanctuary knows that it's not by might nor by power, but by the spirit, if anybody in the sanctuary knows that God ought to receive the glory, it's us fragile and sinful preachers who stand every week and know that if it had not been for the Lord on our side. Um, um, I, uh, I've recently gone back to school. I'm... In the words of Dr. Mapson, I'm almost done. Um, I, I've gone back to school, um, started a PhD program, and in the orientation, Dr. Chandler, they sat us down and they began to talk about all the requirements for completing your PhD. And then they came and the dean of students came in and she gave a presentation, then the academic dean came in. And she said to us, we want you to finish this program. She said, but the one thing that will get you kicked out of the PhD program is if you commit the highest crime of the academy. Now, if you haven't been to school in a while, the highest crime of the academy is plagiarism. Uh, Bishop Twyman, plagiarism will get you kicked out the program. So I, I want to be certain I understood what she meant. So I asked her, I said, Dean, Dean Francis, what 
It's plagiarism. This is what she said. She said, it's real simple, Howard John. If you know you got it from somewhere else and you act like it's yours, we have no choice but to kick you out the program. If you know you didn't make it yourself, but that you received it from another source, but you've got the audacity to stand and act like you got it on your own, we have no option but to kick you out of the program. Brothers and sisters, there are a whole lot of saints and preachers that have been kicked out of the favor of God because they stand and plagiarize every Sunday when they crack open the Holy Word. But when you stand and realize that it came from God and God gave it to you, and if it wasn't for God, you wouldn't be here, then you've got to do what every student knows to do to avoid plagiarism. You've got to cite your source. Every time you see where you got it from, you got to cite your source. Can I preach right here? I learned how to cite my source. Whenever somebody gives their life to the Lord, to God be the glory. Whenever the church fills up on Sunday morning, to God be the glory. Whenever I can stand and declare his word, to God be the glory. Whenever somebody says, Pastor, good job, to God be the glory. Somebody say, cite your source. All right, I, I, I'm done. I got to go. Yes, it's time for us to leave. Time to go. Um, so here's what makes Samson weak. He cites a strange source of his strength. He's seduced into self-sufficiency by his success. But watch this last one that I think weakens him, that weakens all of us. Samson thought he could entertain evil and escape its effect. I, I'm, I'm supposed to crescendo out and I, I'm afraid I'm going to uh, decline out uh, but, but, but Samson's big mistake is that he thought he could play with Delilah um, beloved no matter how strong you are there is a Delilah he, he could handle the Philistines a thousand at a time but there is a Delilah w with degree on the wall and hoop in your belly there's still a Delilah well watch this y'all she, she comes to him three times asking the source of his strength and every time he gives her answer he wakes up and she's done what he told her it, it don't take rocket science to know this one here ain't no good. Why are you messing around with a woman you know is trying to take you out? Because he thinks his strength gives him power over that evil. Watch it, watch it, watch it. He has touched the dead carcass of a lion and he still has strength. He has had strong wine and he still has strength and he believes that even with his haircut he can have strength now the problem is the reason he has strength when he touches the lion and drinks the wine is not because the strength is in the hair the reason he touches the lion and is still strong the reason he drinks the wine is still strong ain't got nothing to do with the hair it has everything to do with a merciful God that we serve a God who makes certain, watch this, you don't always reap what you sow. We serve a God who in spite of how ratchet we were on Friday, gives us Holy Ghost power on Sunday. We serve a God who covers up our faults and failures and allows us to stand as a vessel in his presence. We serve a merciful God. Right now ought to be a good place to say an amen. If you know that you didn't earn the title reverend, but you deserve the title ratchet, then you ought to give God a merciful thanks. If you know that you really shouldn't be called pastor, but you ought to be called lowdown, you ought to thank God for 
for his mercy. Is there anybody in this place that knows he's a merciful God? He's a forgiving God. He's another chance God. He's a sin washing God. He is a merciful God. I got to go now. The Bible says that he experiences God's mercy. And watch what happens at the end of Samson's life. Bible says they gouge out his eyes. They take him down to the metropolis. He's tied up between two pillars. He lifts up his voice and he says, oh God, forgive me and give me another chance. And the Bible says that the hair on his head began to grow back again. And in that model, we see the greatest strength of Samson's life. The greatest strength of Samson's life was that he shows us how to really deal with sin. He shows us how to be victorious over evil. He presents to us a model that helps deal with our human frailties. Because when you look at Samson, Samson points you to God's answer to humanity's sin. The Bible says that Samson's mother had an angel visit to tell her about her pregnancy. Well, there is another woman who had an angelic visit in the sixth month of the pregnancy of her who had been barren. And the angel told her, you're going to have a son. Manoah's wife had a boy that was born a Nazarite. But Mary had a boy who was born from Nazareth. The Bible says that Samson had a lot of strength, but Mary's baby had all power. The Bible says that Samson died between two pillars, but my Jesus died between two thieves. The Bible says that Samson pulled the pillars down and killed the Philistines. Jesus died on the cross and killed the power of sin, killed the victory of grave, took the sting out of death, and when he rose, he declared, I am he who was dead, but I am alive forevermore. And because of him, my hair grows back. Because of him, I've got strength to stand. Because of him, I can preach the good news. Goodbye, brothers. So long, sisters. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But I'm looking for a couple folk that know because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know that I know that I know. Yes, sir. He holds the future and life is worth the living because my Jesus